Today, January 22nd, 2008, the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee of the New Hampshire House of Representatives will be hearing testimony on HB 1623FM, which makes the penalty for marijuana possession in a quantity of less than one and a quarter ounce a mere violation. Matt Simon from nhcommonsense.org, can we get a comment? Absolutely. We're here waiting for the, the hearing to begin for House Bill 1623, and we're very excited about our prospects. Relative to penalties for possession of marijuana, and recognize the crime response of representative bodies. We are never going to arrest our way out of this, this drug problem. It's, it's time we start looking at new alternatives. HB 1623 is one of those alternatives. It's a sensible, mild transition from our current drug policy that could reallocate state and local law enforcement resources more efficiently and could also very well end up preserving the futures of Calvin's young people. Chair, recognize Representative Edwards. This bill presents a practical and limited uh, solution to what many agree is a punishment that needs to be adjusted to fit the nature of the crime. My name is Mark Gordon. I live in Manchester. I'm here in support of the bill. Thousands of Americans suffer such sanctions every day at a rate of one person every 38 seconds. Surely, New Hampshire's limited law enforcement resources would be better served targeting more serious and violent crimes. Chair, we recognize Peter Marinci. I am here as the uh, president of the New Hampshire Chiefs of Police Association. I am also here as the, uh, the chair for the uh, New Hampshire Drug Task Force Hearing Committee. I spent about 10 years of my career uh, working on the cover, uh, then in working against drugs for the last 21 years of my life, and uh, as you can assume, I feel very strongly against this bill. Now the officers are going to ask you that um, like hearing scales, I, I'm assuming. You reference, you reference drug abuse and alcohol in the same phrase. You yeah. don't separate them. I don't know what percent. By following your logic, would you reinstitute prohibition? Knowing what it means, anyone who tries to have families, I certainly would, would consider if I was one at the time when we, when we look at this. Chair, I recognize Stephanie Burke. I'm a medical student. I've done some clinical work, which has shown me a side of drug use and drug abuse. It is entirely possible to use marijuana occasionally and responsibly without becoming addicted to it and without experiencing any impairment in daily functioning. Back in 1973, which you have documented here, that was a huge time of a huge jump and spike in corruption in New York City. Um, they said it was because, with my background in researching, they said that it was due to the implements of such laws for lowering the offenses for drug convictions. Mm -hmm. During alcohol prohibition, uh, crime, uh, gang violence, and corruption skyrocketed went through the roof, and I believe that's one of the reasons why prohibition was, alcohol was repealed. I believe that uh, when drugs are illegal, there's a black market created that opens the window for a lot more corruption than if they're decriminalized. I think there's a lot of corruption now as a result of the black market for all kinds of drugs, including marijuana. Having criminal penalties for marijuana, if we want to remove them for adults, why would we want to put a child in jail? I, I don't think it's safe to use a weapon, certainly not. And it, I had that being said as well, I don't think it's safe to drive a car while you're impaired. That being said, there are a lot of other substances, cold medicine, alcohol, driving tired. There are a lot of ways you can drive impaired or operate a weapon impaired. One needs to use common sense. Marijuana, there's no documented cases of people overdosing on it. The worst that happens to most people is they become very hungry, they do something maybe a little silly. In the medical profession, they have sort of a jargon, um, and they view all sub <laughs> substance use on a spectrum. There is abuse, abuse, and dependence. Dependence is like addiction, basically. 
abuse is you're using a little too much of the substance, more than you should be, might be causing some problems in your life, you're not fully addicted. And use is social use, once in a while, you can stop anytime you want, it's not causing you any troubles. Um, so use is the most benign, and abuse and dependence would be the worst. That's causing you problems. So there are ways to consume it without uh, smoking. <coughs> and even with smoking, the lung cancer risk from that is not as great as tobacco. Representative Winters. I did a little bit of research on this bill, and I know, I know you know that you've dealt with, that, with this topic in this committee for many years. Look back at House Bill 87 from 1999. In the blur, in the calendar after this bill, House Bill 87 came out in the speed to legislate. It says that this bill was introduced to decriminalize the possession of less than one ounce of marijuana, for which the penalty would become a violation. While the subcommittee heard some rather strong reasons to support the medical use of marijuana, there was no hue and cry for this piece of legislation from the public. Mr. Chairman, I think we have the hue and cry from the public today. Times have changed since 1999. And I encourage the committee to support this legislation. Thank you. Chair would call Matt Snyder. It's very difficult to catch people and stop people unless you have snitches or ways to surveil them and in invade their privacy. But even for people who are underage, uh, percentage of 12th graders saying that marijuana is very easy or fairly easy to get. This is under total prohibition of marijuana. That number is always over 80%. Of course, it's important to point out, I think, that it's still going to be illegal if this bill passes. If a kid gets busted for pot, even if it's a violation, their parents are going to find out, the school's going to find out, there's going to be action taken to try to correct the course that this, that this young person's life is on. And I think that having those actions be taken by families and by neighbors and neighborhoods and communities and schools makes a lot more sense than putting an underage kid into the system. Look at the people who have the most problem with alcohol abuse and binge drinking. It's people for whom it's currently prohibited. 18, 19, and 20 year olds on college campuses drink more recklessly and more dangerously than anybody else in our society. And we learned in the movie Read for Madness that you lead down a path to criminality, insanity, and even death. <laughs> well, young people know better today. We've had prohibition of marijuana since 1937 in this country. It's been a very aggressive prohibition policy since since 1970. And I was interested that you mentioned the spike, uh, Representative Nicolonis, in, in, in 1973 and corruption. 1973 is directly after the war on drugs was escalated by a factor of 10 by the Nixon administration. It was by increasing penalties and increasing enforcement that, you, that prices were driven up and the black market became lucrative tied directly to the profits that are to be made. Alcohol is far more addictive than marijuana. Tobacco is far more addictive than marijuana. They are very difficult substances once you are dependent on them, all the way over here on the dependent side, to get off. As a teacher, I used to go from coffee pot to coffee pot. And yes, coffee isn't a mind-altering substance, and it isn't intoxicating. But I was certainly addicted to coffee in a way which I was never addicted to marijuana and, and recreational use in my younger years. 